thank you very much for making time to join us for the ninth session of the Yield Shop webinar series. And as you may all know, um, this webinar is part is one of the capacity building activities under the Young Innovators in Entrepreneurship and Leadership Development, which is the Yield Project. And um, the Yield Project essentially aims to assist young entrepreneurs to assess and maximize opportunities in the rapidly evolving agri-food system uh, in Africa. And we do this through an integrated approach that combines collaborative research with capacity uh, building. Uh, today's session happens to be the last one under the phase one of the YIELD project, um, which was a pilot, but we do hope to continue on providing this capacity training um, in, in the future. And we will, we will greatly ask that you share your input on what the next phase of um, this kind of webinar could be so that we can best save um, your um, interest. I would request that for all those that are on here, you please provide us with your email addresses. So your name and your email, you can type it into the uh, panel, the chat panel, uh, so that we will be able to keep in touch with you as we roll out uh, future uh, webinars. So for today, we will be discussing um, a topic in which I would say uh, it's somewhat dreaded by agripreneurs, but it, it is an, a, an essential aspect of any business development, which is the issue of competition. And we'll be talking about um, how do we navigate a competitive environment um, as agripreneurs. And we are happy to be joined here uh, by uh, Mr. Uche Ebuna, um, who will be facilitating the uh, session um, for us. Uh, Uche is a director, uh, is a director of the enterprise, is a director for the Enterprise Lab cons um, Consultancy um, in Nigeria. Uh, he, he's also the program director for the Global Entrepreneurship um, Network. He's a business coach and a mentor uh, who has provided consultancy to a number of small and medium um, enterprises and also um, consultancy to a number of international um, development uh, program around the area of an uh, entrepreneurship and you, uh, um, particularly in the, in, in the area of youth. And um, I would allow him to share some more with you as he goes through his presentation. We are indeed privileged to have Uche. So I'll hand over to Uche. Uche, thank you very much for um, your willingness to help educate the next generation of agropreneurs. We, we look forward to your presentation. Please proceed with it. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you to all the participants for joining this session. I'm very, very happy. So as um, Felix said earlier on, uh, my name is Uche Guna, and I'm a faculty member also in Enterprise Development Center with the Pan-Atlantic University. Now for the topic for today, we'll be navigating a competitive landscape for agropreneurs. Why is this a major topic? Now, it's also one of the reasons why businesses struggle, okay? And in my own experience, with a lot of businesses I've actually consulted for, understanding the product is one thing. Understanding your service is one thing. But being able to be competitive becomes a challenge to a lot of entrepreneurs today. So that's why we decided to focus on it today, just to give us an idea of what exactly are the things that we need to think about when we're trying to navigate a competitive landscape. Okay, all right, so I'll just, I'll just dive in right in, okay? And then the attributes for, for agripreneurs, how do, you, how do you look at competitiveness as an attribute for yourself? Okay, then we'll, so I, what I've actually done is that the competitive landscape is quite large. So I'm gonna focus on the word, the acronym INNOVATE, because it cuts across every industry and it's the easiest way to navigate a competitive landscape, all right? So I have some opening questions and I want the participants to actually join in this part, in this session. The first question will be, in what ways has my business been competitive since it started operations? So whether you're a startup 
whether you're existing, but mostly I think existing businesses will, will, should have the answer to this. So I want you to think about it, to reflect on it. In what ways has my business been competitive since it started operations? All right? The second question would be, if your customers were asked whether your business is an innovative company, what do you think the answer would be? And lastly, what kind of form, of form of technology have you applied in your business so far? Now, why are these questions important? The reason why you decide to go into business, the drive might be, might be passion, but do not forget that in an industry where there are a lot of players, you need to compete. You need to gain a market share. You need to build a brand. The consumers today, the customers today, want so much that they would always dissect the product or service in terms of value. So you are always, there's always a benchmark compared to other competitors, to the players in the industry. And that's why we have the major players. That's why we have the market leaders. We have the market challengers. We have the market followers. We have the market niches. So the reasons why this goes, why we have these players is that they push each other. And whilst we wait for um, Uche to uh, sign back on, uh, would any of the agripreneurs attempt to answer some of the starting questions? Well, so uh, <laughs> I will attempt to ask, uh, answer some of the questions. And the first one he asked about, like, if I'm right, he was asking how we understand competi competitiveness. Is that true? Yes. So uh, in, in that case, um, competitiveness, it's... Uh, a situation where you have two or more people or businesses looking for the same customer or looking for the same uh, uh, source of, 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 of paycheck or revenue. So everybody tries to either provide the best or in terms of quality or in terms of price or other values so that the customer would always think about you first or somebody else. And in our business, where our farm is located, it's a conglomerate of farmers. We have a lot of people cultivating pineapples over there. It's like a pineapple center. So there is a lot of competition over there. And um, what we have done for the past uh, four years is to bring some sort of innovation in the way we operate. The first thing we we use on our farm that have set us apart is the use of barcodes for traceability. So usually when the factories who buy from us come to the farm, they scan the barcode and they can see all um, uh, treatments and chemicals and protocols that we have applied on each plot. And uh, it makes transactions or it makes traceability really, really easy for us. And uh, that has been something that has set us apart. So far. Okay. Well, th thank you very much, Joshua. That's yeah. very insightful. Um, Uche is back, is back on, so I will let him proceed, and then we can um, get some more insights later on. Uche, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, Felix. Sorry about that. All right. So as I was saying earlier on, I was focused on competitiveness as an attribute for an entrepreneur. So let's look at why should you be competitive? The reason why you should be depends on the fact that you're a business owner, you have a product or a service that you want to deliver value to the customer and consumer as well. There are also other players trying to deliver the same value to consumers and customers as well. So you are fighting in an industry, you're playing in an industry where there is strong competition of trying to gain the largest market share or even gain a little percent of the market share. So it's expected that as an agripreneur or an entrepreneur, you should possess a strong desire to be more successful than others. There has to be a drive to be more successful than others. So that's how the competitive spirit comes in because you're challenging yourself every time as an entrepreneur or as an agripreneur that what do I need to do to be relevant in the market? What is the second one? the ability to create, innovate, produce, and sell goods and services in national and international markets, and at the same time, maintaining or enlarging its market share and profits. I'll say that again. The ability to create, innovate, 
produce and sell goods and services in national and international markets, and at the same time, maintaining or enlarging its market share and profits. So you see, what you're trying to do is create a product, innovate. These products are focused around volume, all right? So either in your own market, your own local market, either in the international market, but at the same time, you need to be able to maintain and increase your own market share and profits. You're in the business for profits. So why are you trying to create value and be competitive? Do not make sure that it's, a, it's still focused on profits because what we find out is that at times is that because a lot of entrepreneurs are trying to compete, they spend most of their resources without acquiring profits for it. So it's a big challenge. So that's why the focus is where in trying to create an innovative product, right? The focus should still be on what maintaining or increasing its market, your market share and your profits. Okay, so I said earlier on, I have a tool for navigating a competitive landscape, and it's a word innovate. It's the right word for it for right now. It takes you, it, it breaks down every aspect of your own business. All right, so from the entrepreneurs, from the agri, agripreneur aspect, actually, right? Newness, which is also fresh. The end is what? Novel or original. V, value. A, affirmation. T, technology and e evaluation so we're going to take it one by one and try to explain it in the own in the context of our own business based on what we do all right so idea generation and uh, before you started your products or you started your business or developed your products generating the idea becomes the first thing you do but generating the idea doesn't just apply to you starting the business it also applies continuously in the business so whether you're focused on marketing whether you're focused on your operations, whether you're focused on your finances, what we are saying is that you need to come up with a system that generates ideas from time to time because your competitors are also trying to come up with products that are better than the ones you have or better than the ones they've, they've put as well in the market to make them create more value for the, for the customers better than their competitors or their rivals. So it's important for you to understand that there's a system, a system has to be in place in your businesses where you generate, you come up with ideas, ideas around customer service, ideas around product development, ideas around your HR as well, your staff as well. Don't forget your staff become, they're your first words, internal words, customers, they're customers, so they're the internal customers. And finding a way to bring out the best out of them also can give you a competitive advantage. So you, think, so you think about the issues, the problems, the challenges of the current markets, the industry and the environment. So you focus more of developing a product that has a need for the market or the industry that what you are in. Also, when it comes to your own business, when it comes to the internal part of your business, there are operations that might not be as efficient that, that, they, that in terms of they might affect the result or the outcome of your product. And this is, if you, have a, if you have a relationship with your customers, with your, your internal customers, who are your employees, you should understand where there are where challenges with your operations. So there as well, there should be a system where they are able to develop a system or a process that works better for them, that allows them to be, able to work, to be efficient at their job. Your own job as a business owner is to create that system where everyone comes up with idea generation in making the business better, in making the product or the services better, in making your customer service better, okay? One important aspect of idea generation, and which is the current trend right now, is design thinking. Why is design thinking important? This is you looking at it from the consumer or the customer's perspective, looking at it from the challenges they are going through. So it's not like saying, oh, I have a passion to develop a product. I have a passion to come up with um, um, tomato, tomato paste. Is you find out, for example, what, ex what exists, what are the challenges that exist in that industry? What are the challenges that exist in that environment? So design thinking is more of bringing your own team, right? And putting up, putting up a challenge and letting everyone brainstorm around it. Find out the best solutions. No idea is stupid. No idea is silly, right? But you as the owner, the business owner, the CEO, the entrepreneur of the business, you make the decision, the final decision. But relating to based on developing a product that suits, that best suits the need 
of the consumers or the customers. That's why I said it applies in your operations. It can be marketing, it can be production, it can be finances as well. But it should be a system where you should always come up with idea generation. This allows you build a competitive advantage. It allows you navigate a competitive landscape. So you understand the fact that continuously your business keeps growing because of the ideas that, con that come into the business. Okay, what is the next slide? Newness. Now, there is something about what companies have understood about consumers. It's about something fresh. So when we say something fresh, basically innovation. And innovation doesn't have to be just a new product. It can be also the way the product is being used. It can be the usage of the products. I'll give you a good example. Pick milk. Pick milk in Nigeria. The product has been there for a very, very long time. But Pick milk started a different strategy in how they were marketing to their consumers. They started telling us how to use the product. They also showed us on the TV adverts of the different food or different, different products you could mix, you could use the product with. That is a different approach and also coming up with something new and fresh. Consumers like to, so they get used to a product for a long time, right? And once there is one they get used to that product, at times a new, a, another player or a competitor comes into the market with the same product, but because it's a fresher project, they've never heard of the product before, right? They always want to try that product. So looking at your own business, looking at your own product, you have to find a way to always bring out different ways in which the product can be used if it applies to your own business. Or it can also be in terms of what? The customer service. So basically your product might still be the same, but how you approach your customer service, how they crave it. So there has to be something new for the customer every time. So newness is important, something fresh all the time. In farming, for example, we are moving from traditional practice of farming to a more urban practice. This is a newness in that industry. This is a fresh approach to it, right? What does it help you to do? It helps you to what? increase your yields. It helps you be more efficient, more effective as well. So as agripreneurs, I'm very sure if you look at your own systems, right? The, the technology has brought newer ways of doing certain things, which allows you to, to what? increase your yields and also increase your profit margins. So it's important that we look at that approach from the newness, fresh, something new. So currently you do research to find out in your own industry, in your own market, right? What else can I offer? What other innovations, what other innovations can I use to create a better value with the product I have or the service I have? So that's why we said successful businesses have, punch, have to punch, continually introduce new products or services to retain and acquire new customers and create a competitive advantage over their rivals. So the most important thing is, why, why are you doing this? You're trying to retain your existing customers and also trying to acquire new customers. So the fact that we have customers right now, they get bored with the product. So it doesn't always have to be about the product. It can also be about the service. That's why customer service is important. What is the next one, Novel? All right, so this, this applies to businesses that are able to come up with something new and original that has never been seen before, right? What this does is that it gives the first mover advantage. It gives the first mover advantage. So you're able to come into the market with something that has never been done before, right? And you gain the market share immediately. Why allowing your competitors to try and catch up with it? Mostly you find this with bigger companies, bigger corporations, right? Where they're able to spend so much money which in research and development. Because what they're trying to do is find out what, what is, to find out the trend and find out what customers will need in the nearby future. So it's not about you reacting to what customers are asking for right now, no. It's about you trying to understand that in the next five years, what, what will be the wants of the customers? So research allows you to, to understand that based on the attitude, based on the trends, based on also environmental changes as well, okay? So that is why we said, if you're able to approach this aspect of being competitive, competitive in terms of the product itself and also the service, but more focused on trying to come up with something that is very original. The product might be existing already, but the way you're being able to offer the product is also under way of being, bringing out a newer product. Before I go on, I would, like, I would like to take some questions right now, just to see whether we've understood the few slides I've taken and see whether we can actually apply it to our own businesses right now. Hello, Uche, we can, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. All right, so 
I was asking, I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask some questions based on the slides we've already talked about so far. Because I, what we, because I want them to try and apply to their own businesses to, to see whether they have any examples of their own products or services that apply to some of the examples I've used. Hi, Uche. While we're waiting for the entrepreneurs, um, my question really is about skill sets. And um, if an entrepreneur doesn't have the ability to carry out that kind of research that will give them insight into future trends and patterns, then they might feel stuck. So what would you advise them? All right. So what? So basically, what I talked about at the beginning, I said they were, so basically, it's about we have the market leaders, we have the market challenges, we have the market followers, and we have the market niches. Right? So you're trying to navigate a competitive landscape, right? Doesn't mean you have to be the market leader. But what you're trying to do is actually make sure that you are on the same, you are competing to be able to deliver a product or a service, right? That still makes you relevant. So at times, what happens with the big companies like whether Putter and Gamble or Unilever, right? Is that they're able to come up with the product, first of all, right? So what, so most SMEs are more of market followers and not necessarily challenges. So what they're able to do is take that information and do a proper research, which doesn't really cost that much. It's just trying to find out whether there's a way they can create a value for their own smaller markets. That's that new innovation. So it's not necessarily doing something that makes you better than the competitors. We're focusing on your own market and trying to create value with a new innovation that that market leader has introduced to the market. So, so Uche, would you advise that they invest the money in finding someone who has the skill sets to help them explore their own sector or market if they can't do it, if they don't have the yes, time? Or, okay. Yeah. So basically, what we always advise entrepreneurs is the skill set is very important. And if you do not have the skill set, you need to get somebody that has the skill set. With the, you need to get someone that has the skill set, right? Investing in skill set is very important, right? So what we said to invest, it's more of like finding the right people, all right? Also, there are, there are places where SMEs are able to approach bigger companies, right? And do an internship just to learn how that product is being deliver, delivered. So that, that also helps the entrepreneur to build his own skill sets with the capacity of a larger company. Thank you. All right, so if we don't have any other question, we can just move forward. All right, so let's look at original. So if you notice, we're still talking about almost the same thing, about the product, you know, about something being new, something being fresh, right? But the reason why we're using all these terms is just to give you, to buttress the fact that you need to understand that it's about the product and services in this aspect, okay? So when we say successful businesses, I just don't have to be completely original. So based on what you were actually asked me, right? That's why I said it doesn't have to be something very new, but it's about building on something that has changed the way we live and filling the gaps to make it even a better product or service. So you, you observe, we observe with market followers that they are able to provide something not necessarily better, but more focused to their own market segments. So what the big players usually do is that they introduce a product that applies, that should apply to every segment of the market. You as a small business owner takes the product and finds a way to make it better to apply to your own market segments. That is what you're trying to do. The focus of being competitive in your own industry is not looking at the bigger player and fighting for their own market. No, it's taking what they brought out, right, and working it to try and to changing it to make sure that it pleases and creates value for your own segment. That was, that's what that creates or that makes original for your own brand. In that way, you stand to make a bigger profit. And it comes to something new, but you're also taking a big risk, which is true, yes. So what we're saying right now is that you're able to make a bigger profit, right, when the value applies to your own segment. It makes no sense if you take something from a bigger player, right, that doesn't apply to your own segment just because it's an innovation in your own industry and apply it to your market segment. So competitiveness still focus on the fact that you're competitive, you're com so you're competing against your own rival in your own industry, but then based on, on the level in which you are playing. So always use the fact that, use, always use that, um, so that description of saying the market leader, the market follower, the market challenger, and the market nature. And I said earlier on that SMEs usually fall between the market follower because they do, not, they, they do not necessarily have the capacity and the resources to be able to bring out innovations 
that would actually change the industry itself. So they take what the market leaders have actually done, right, and modify it to create value for their own segments. Now, value, which is the most important, the value proposition, which I call it. So the value proposition is still what makes you different. What makes you different? And I said, it's not always about the product. It can also be about your services. It can also be about your operations. But are you consistently creating value? At some point, when you're providing the same product for the same for the cost for the customer, right? The value, you might lose that value because the customer sees it as something already that he already owns. So as simple as repackaging, as simple as creating a new brand, as simple as creating smaller samples or smaller sizes of your products is creating value for it because also it also has to do with the income power of the customers. And also you're trying to create value by also entering other segments. So we expect that once you're growing in your industry, you should also think about how do I move into other segments? How do I create value? How do I expand my business? How do I provide for other segments? How do I provide? It's important for you as a business owner. It's important for your growth as well. And you can do this by also by, 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 so by, also by expanding your product range, sorry. Expanding your product range to allow it to appeal to a larger segment of customers. So you always need to focus on building consistency in your quality with your products and your deliverables. Trying to be competitive, you cannot, so you, you, cannot have a, you cannot have a challenge in your operations where your products do not. So usually with food, it's always a challenge. So let's use a bakery, for example. The bread, I have this, I have this bakery uh, in my own location where today you buy a loaf of bread and the taste of that loaf of bread is different from the next day. There is no consistency in taste and that's quality. So if I come today, I'm like, oh, I'm happy with the bread. Tomorrow if I come, I'm not happy with the bread. Definitely if I'm able to get a cost, um, to get uh, another brand who is able to deliver consistency in that taste because the taste is the reason why I'm coming in the first place, which is the quality of the bread, okay? If I'm able to deliver that consistency, I might as well lose the, cons the, the, the customer or the consumer. So always focus on creating value and building consistency. Your product has to be the same quality every time. If it has to do with your operations, your productions, you need to make sure that all these things are efficient so that you always get that consistency in the quality. Also asking yourself, we say value. Value is not just always from your own person as a business owner. Value is really from the consumer's perception, perspective. Sorry. What is their perception about value? What do they call value? So if you're producing a product where customers look at the size of the product as being too expensive for the size, then it is not a value for them. Maybe a smaller size of that product at a cheaper price or an affordable price is what they call, what would be a value for them. So it's always focused on the consumer. You create value with your own services, with your own, with your own thing, but value in terms of value offering always is from the perspective of the consumer or the customer. Who do we work with? Your partners can create value for you. As simple as having a challenge with your POS system and not using the right bank or partner can affect your quality in terms of service. So if you have a store in which you provide where people can pay at the counter, well, always, they always complain about just as simple as having a POS challenge, all right? That alone can affect the way they think about your brand. So who do we work with? It's important to get in the right people, the right partners, and able to deliver our value. Because we, the partners will not be judged. Our own brand will be judged as the value offering that, we're, that the, the consumers or the customers are getting. Affirmation. Now, for me, this is one of the biggest, why it's, why it's a big challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs is that when we work in teams and we have staff working for us, we we notice that they come up with different ideas. And as the boss, we always need to affirm those ideas and products. Do we do our own due diligence before giving a go ahead to say, okay, you know what? 
let's put let's let's develop this product as the ceo or as a business owner as an entrepreneur you need to consistently research about products or ideas ideas can come from team members can come from staffs well you make that decision in developing or creating that product or the service too many ideas no implementation so you have a business where Every day, it's about different ideas of how to be competitive, right? But you do not implement them. Either it's a challenge with the resources. What you should focus on is the idea that you can implement. It is not about having too many ideas. It's about having the right idea and the right product. So you can have different, you can have various products, and none of them are be creating value for your customers. You can have various services, and no one will be creating value. For your customers or you can also have just one product and you'll be creating a huge value for your customers so at times we find that people are trying to expand too soon oh so we've been in business for three years i think it's, it's time to expand no it's about creating value it's about making sure that you are from the product the idea that needs to be implemented based on the need of the, the customers so implementation is key to building a competitive landscape for you as a business owner. Providing resources to achieve results is where you come in as CEO or the, the entrepreneur, the owner of the business. You provide the resources that need to achieve those results based on acquiring maybe more machineries, acquiring better quality raw materials. But it's important that you get those right resources that can allow you to achieve your desired results. Technology. For innovation, most times when we, when we hear innovation, technology comes to our mind. We're not wrong by saying that. Technology is a key element in building competitive advantage. Agropreneurs must learn to apply technology to their businesses and build a competitive land, land, a landscape. Right now, it's about smart farming. It's about digital specialization and farming. So you need to ask yourself as well, is that, are you being able to apply this technology? And if you're not able to apply technology, why, what are the reasons you can't? Okay, so in Nigeria today, what this has done for the Nigerian agro-system or the agriculture and the farmers as well, is that it has been able to allow those, so you have a lot of corporate workers who want to be farmers, but do not have the time to farm or to cultivate. So what what are, are we doing with technology? Right, we have um, we have brands like Smart Farm. They provide this technology on a platform where you can register online. You could pay for an acre of land. You could ask for the products you want, the raw material, and they would they would they would cultivate it for you for the six month cycle. They would also get off tickets for you as well. So you are sitting down in your own office and being able to manage your farm without physically being there. That is what technology has done. All right, so this has allowed farms to be able to grow bigger and faster by providing, by allowing other partners that are interested to come on board easily, which is just, just bringing their financial resources. So it's important also the use of drones. The use of drones, I think it's something that for um, to also help with personal diseases. So I think as well, you don't necessarily need to own a drone, but you can partner with a company that owns the drone and allows you to be able to pay maybe a minimum, like, you know, like a small amount of fee, but allows you to give you that ability to, to see, identify pests and diseases in time before they take over or they, they, they disrupt your, your crops. As well, so these are important. Driverless tractors might not necessarily be for for the smaller SMEs, right? The SMEs themselves, but it might actually be. But if it's something that it also takes that takes that stress of somebody always having to be there. So this the, that cost, that cost of labor is taken out as well. So by also reducing your costs, you're also finding a way to increase your profit margin as well. So technology can be looked at in different ways. It's also your mode of payment, yeah, how you're able to market, how do you market your product, how do you display your product to your consumers, how do you inform them, how do you create awareness? So that's why I asked that opening question, right? In what kind of, of form have you been able to apply technology in your business? Because if you're not applying technology in your business right now, that means you're not, you're not, you're not placing your business to survive. Your strategy right now is to try and adapt to the what to the changing trends. 
and technology is consistently changing. So it should be applied at any form, at even the smallest amounts of technology matters, just payment method alone and marketing. And lastly, how do you evaluate? When you're, when you're doing the innovate, when you're using the acronym innovate, right? And you are trying to apply value and you're trying to compete with your rivals at the same time, increasing your profit margin. Do you evaluate the impact of your product service among your customers? Do you, by doing, do you do surveys? Do you get our feedbacks to find out whether you're doing, you're providing that value they want, you're providing that service they want, or whether you could do better? Because if your competitors are, be, are, are listening to the consumers and providing a platform or a system where they're able to get proper feedback to allow them improve on the product itself, it allows them to be able to, to gain an advantage over you. So you, at every point, you always need to evaluate your competitive landscape in the industry, evaluate your product, your service. And you, the best way to do this is trying to gather feedback, okay? Feedback from your suppliers, feedback from your buyers, feedback from your, from your staff as well, is that right now, what is our position in the market? How can we be better? How do we remain competitive? So it's, it's evaluating every aspect of your business, every department. We always say the three, so the three core parts, always the operations, the marketing, and the finance. So those aspects really are the ones you focus on when it comes to operations, right? Are we doing very well? Can we, can we do things better? Based on the current one, we've actually, so you've actually applied something into your system. You've applied a new service or a new, a new production line. You need to evaluate it. So you are producing more, right, at what, at what uh, time rate, right? You're producing more. Are you, being able, are you being able to still provide that value at the same time? Okay. So right now, uh, thank you very much, guys, for listening. Uh, I would like to take questions because usually it's easy to always have an open discussion about this so that we can have examples applying to your own businesses and we can find a way to actually give you the right answers to allow you to be better in providing, creating value in your own business. Okay, thank you very much for um, that insightful uh, presentation. We will open it up to questions um, and also some ideas um, on the on the ground. I know Joshua has started sharing something with us. Uh, Fred, Fred, we also we will also be pleased to get your insights into um, in what ways have you applied any of the principles that he had outlined out there in your own business. And um, I'm not sure Chuku was able to join us. Um, I know he was on a few minutes ago. So Fred and Joshua, please share with us, um, in what ways have you applied any of those principles? And if you have any, any questions, please do ask. All right, thank you very much. Uh, would, uh, mine is more of how we um, identified um, the relevant innovations that we needed. Uh, for the sake of Ochu, I am Uche, I'm a, uh, a pineapple farmer, and I also do a little bit of vegetables on the side, um, supplying to uh, processing companies that process and export to Europe mainly. Okay. Um, for us, the first uh, time that I identified that innovation was important was at a client meeting when we we're having a meeting with the, um, our buyer. I wanted to find out what their pain points were. What are some of the things that they need farmers to do that farmers don't do? Or what are the difficulties they have with most farmers? So they mentioned issues of traceability. They mentioned other issues like uh, unwillingness to invest in irrigation and stuff like that. So okay. immediately we saw that as an opportunity to set us apart. So when right. we set up our, our um, barcode for tracing uh, chemical applications for each plot on the farm, it helped a lot. And so far, they refer other farmers to come to us to look at what we are doing over there. And we've been one of the very good um, suppliers in, in that industry. So I think one way to identify how to set yourself apart is to engage your buyers directly and find out if they need anything better than what you have exactly. um, presently. Yeah. Very good. So that's basically feedback. That's very good. Okay. So 
I would like to ask, um, how often do you evaluate your impact? Okay, so myself and my team, we have, usually we have six months uh, meetings okay. um, to find out whether some of the innovations that we put in our business is making sense, or whether it's improving uh, okay. um, sales or not. So uh, historically, we have actually applied, used drone technology. We use it twice a year. We don't own it. We just rent from those who buy it for photography. And then we right. use it for, uh, we just take a day, we fly, we take the images, and then we have a, a friend who is very good at this analysis, and then he does it for us for free. So we sit back and then we talk every six months to find out whether what innovation or the innovations or the new ideas we've implemented, if it's improving sales, exactly. otherwise, if it's not, then we have to just uh, okay. think twice and not spend further on it. What about, um, what about your marketing? Yes. So marketing, um, my, we use social media a lot, but it's not really a big issue for us because we are still um, supplying only about 20% of the demand that comes to us monthly. Okay. Right. So we okay. don't see marketing as a problem. But obviously in the next few years when we, we, we expand or if the buyers find new Pineapple farmers, perhaps we will not be. Uh, we will have excess, and then we we'll have to engage in, in uh, robust marketing. But at the moment, we don't do much in marketing. Okay. All right. So, what what would be your biggest challenge right now in trying to just so just trying to, to to compete with your your the rivals in your industry? Or yeah. What would be your biggest challenge right now? What would be your biggest challenge? Is? I think in terms of fighting the competition. Our biggest challenge, personally, myself and my farm, is with, uh, with size of operation. Because these are guys that have been doing the same business for 20, 30 years, and they have massive 200, 300 acre plantations, and we just have 35. So in terms of, of people who want to buy in bulk, like the buyers from Europe and others who want to buy directly from farmers, it is okay. a big challenge in terms of your yeah, size. So uh, oh. because of that, sometimes we get carried away by, oh my God, we need to expand fast. We need to expand fast. But at times exactly. you say that you think it's really not necessary if you have your local market and you are making your margins. It's really not necessary trying to do what everybody is doing by growing mm. too big. Yeah, very good. And that's the butcher the point I'm trying to make is that at mm. times a lot of people are focused on challenging the bigger, the bigger, the bigger players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you're you're spending, you're trying, you're investing so much resources, yeah, and not being able to still compete with them. So it, it still comes focuses on on value, is that yeah. you need to understand your own market first because growth. So you you grow in stages, yeah, right? and it's, at times it's not really good for an SME to grow too fast, mm -hmm. because it's always the same way you, you're going to collapse as well or falling back into the ground, to the ground. Yeah. So yeah. it's always to identify. It should be a growth plan for you. Okay, right. which you tell yourself that okay, in the next two three years, this is the window or this is the market we want to be playing with. But already mm. you set things in place, yeah, that would allow you get to that to get to that position in the next three to five years. Mm. Right. So it's, it's it's still first of all, it's trying to be a market leader in your own smaller industry, your own smaller market, right? right. Giving the and learning, always learning from the bigger players is right. something to take. That's why I use that market leader, the market challenger, and the cooler. Yeah, because if you realize the market leaders are always the ones that have the capacity, they have the resources, so they introduce the products. Yeah, it's really easily it's, it's easy for them. But guess what? The market followers who are mostly the SMEs, right? Mm -hmm. Take that product or that service and break it into pieces. <laughs> Yeah. To create a better or greater value for their own right. markets. Yeah. That is what the SME is being able to do. So it's not always about having so much resources. Because yes. I find a lot of um, entrepreneurs are saying, oh, I don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources. You have not taken over your own market. You have not been yeah. able to put so much value. Why, what are you trying to play in the bigger market? In the bigger like market. Yeah. Capacity for. Yeah. 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 So it's, I, I like the fact that you're, you, you've taken this approach. It's actually the right approach, okay? Yeah. So you, as long as you continue and provide those, so those, you, you create a, like a framework that allows you to grow 
and expand at your own capacity. Yeah. You're fine. But evaluation is important. And once you do that, you can always tell because what we're trying to avoid SMEs from doing is wasting their resources. Mm. So you're, you're doing something that is not working. Yeah. But because everyone everyone is doing it, you assume yeah, uh, so the right, do it. The right <laughs> yeah. thing. No. Okay. You have to evaluate it. Does it make right. me, when, when we say it competitive, does it make me competitive also to my own consumers or customers? Mm. Mm. Because they are the ones that derive value, not your rivals. True. So that's, that's, that's very good. So Uche, maybe while, while we see if Fred is coming um, on, do you have okay. any, uh, what would be your greatest accomplishment in terms of this topic that you're sharing with us in terms of navigating um, the competitive environment? What would you say is the most challenging and most successful experience you've had? Many years ago, I, I went into retail. And at the time I went into retail, we, I had a product, we had a product that was, uh, that was a major, or the, probably the market leader mm -hmm. in the industry. But the biggest, one of the biggest challenges was that the, the product wasn't produced locally. Okay. It was produced in another country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, because the reason why we decided to produce outside was because of the quality. We assumed that we couldn't get the same machines that could um, actually give us that quality we're looking for. And we already created a value with our customers based on the quality of the product. Now, what we see, so there are also factors that can affect your brand and can, that, can, that can affect you in terms of trying to be competitive. And we call this, you know, like, so if you use the personal, for example, the political, the environmental, the social, the economic and technological as well based on political decisions. So inflation, right? If you're changing the dollar, there was a fall in the Naira and it cost us so much to bring that product after producing, to bring that product into the country that we couldn't sell at the same price that was, that was valued to our customers again. So we decided to increase the price a little bit so that we could still break even, not make profit, break even. Unfortunately for us, customers, because there was what, there was also, we had competitors and we had other products, other products, substitute products that were similar to our own products. Customers moved to the other products. That other product was produced locally and we were still able to sell at the same price. We were still offering, so the quality wasn't the same as ours, but what I want first, um, um, guys to take on with this is that customers change, customers' attitudes, chain towards products mm -hmm. and also it, it focuses a lot on pricing mm. so pricing is also it comes it comes with value so the quality wasn't the problem the quality was the same but because you add substitute products that were cheaper the customers decided to move mm. and that affected our market we lost the market because we're not able to offer the price we're able to offer the same, same quality but not the price and so what what we are to start thinking about was what producing locally okay so even in terms of also your supplier when it comes to raw materials smes need to be careful how they source their raw materials because once you know you're not able to provide consistency in your raw materials and your price fluctuates and it affects your selling price you can also lose value of your product to your to your customers so mm. that was for me the biggest challenge because at some point we had to close down the business because we were running at a loss and that was something that we did not we did, we did not at the beginning so when i was talking i said earlier on that you need to always there's a growth plan there's always a growth plan so if you're producing for example outside your 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 markets right mm -hmm. to be a focus that at some point i need to produce locally if i have suppliers Outside my, 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 my location, at some point, I need to find or build suppliers that can give me the raw materials and it's because it will be cheaper for me as well and, and I can be sure of consistency. So these are certain things we need to look at while growing because you can be a leader today or just because your supplier, if only have one supplier, for example, decides to increase the price of your raw materials 
Mm -hmm. I'm forcing you to increase the price of your own products. Consumers can lose interest in your products. No, thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, so I see that um, Samuel Jan has also joined us. Okay. What I have done is that, as he rightly said in answering the question, I've always looked out for alternative in terms of whatever I do. So in terms of selling in the other countries, what we do is that initially we send our products there and be able to supply. But then afterwards, we get a local partner that produces the raw material. Then we provide the standards. Then we provide some of the materials they need to ensure that at least the cost of our raw material remains within the budget and our pricing model so that we are still very competitive and then be able to, because we are guided by our mission, where we want to provide people with quality vegetable at an affordable price. So irrespective of the fluctuations or the market and other things, because of the services we provide for our growers in relation to the raw material, it gives us the edge all the time to be able to keep our prices. So we, can, we are able to keep our price for like three years without increasing it or anything. Because at the end of the day, we are maintaining the raw material, which is the pepper we have at that price that keeps us still in business. Very good. Uh, yeah, my my follow-up question would be, how, how do you ensure consistency? Yeah, because one of the <laughs> things that he had talked about is uh, being able to have a consistent product so that today your product is like this, tomorrow is there. And then having to rely on multiple um, outgrowers to, uh, to produce for you. How do you ensure that your product is consistent over time? Okay, so what we have done is that we have a standard. So we've developed a standard, a standard operating procedure, even for our outgrowers. If you want to be our outgrower, we sign an off-taker agreement, the memorandum of an agreement. And in the memorandum of an agreement, there is specific variety. We only do three varieties of pepper, the Cayenne, the Legon 18, and African Bird's Eye. Now, if you are going to do the, these three varieties, there is a certain standard that you are supposed to follow. Every week, you are supposed to report to us. We have a template form you are supposed to fill. Once you fill the template form, you send the form and images of that. So then we visit the farm, announce and unannounce to, ver to validate the information you've sent us. So at the end of the day, whoever, if the person is in, let's say, Kumase, uh, Sogakop, Tamale, producing pepper for us, they are all following the same standard. <laughs> And it's the same variety they are growing. So at the end of the day, we are able to ensure that we are consistent in terms of the taste, in terms of the hotness, in terms of the color. Because that is what we promise the people, our customers. And that's what they know us for. And that's what we stand out for. So what we have done is that we have our standard operating procedure. Aside that, also, we've developed a reporting structure for the outgrowers. That it's meant, it's in the local dialect. We've explained it so well for them to use. And every week they are reporting to us. Then we do the announce visitation and unannounced visitation. So when we go and there's any challenge, we quickly help them to address it so that it does not get out of hand to so maintain the parameters that we have for what we do. Th thank you very much, uh, Samuel. Uh, Uche, we have, well, there's another question here uh, coming from Fred. Um, and it says that, is it best to have an independent evaluator for your service rather than yourself? Uh, because he feels that sometimes there's a temptation for us to sing our own praise if we are evaluating ourselves yeah usually most yeah i like that question because most times we find out that we are biased because it's our own product um and that's why i was talking about the fact that when we evaluate independent can can actually i think it can benefit you in terms of having um like a more general evaluator okay so most times we're actually biased towards our own our own um, ideas and products so yes um that might actually work but at the same time, we expect that knowing fully well that you're in the business to, to, be, to be competitive, right? If you're able to take out that being biased and focus on the fact that you need to deliver and you need to create a competitive um, advantage all the time, right? And you also have a team as well. So it's just not you doing that evaluation, right? It's, it's actually more of a, a, a team, a team work, team effort, and not just an individual person. So it can work both ways. You can it can be combined. Um, if the if the business is not doesn't feel they're capable enough to give to evaluate and give the um, the right um, result in terms of what will push them to be more competitive, right? Then yes, you should get an independent evaluator. But it's still a decision the, the business has to make because of cost as well. Okay. The the, the second question is um, he's in the business of providing 
expensive farm inputs for farmers. Uh, but then there's a competition coming from the government who is subsidizing um, inputs of lower quality. So his question is, how do you overcome such a competition? So there's competition from the government providing lower quality. Yes, so the government is providing lower quality, uh, but he is also providing um, expensive farm inputs. So, so oh, I think... Okay, so just, just saying that alone tells me that there are two different markets. Mm -hmm. Because lower quality and expensive are not the same market. I shouldn't yeah. it even be the same market. So understanding that is key, first of all. Target market is very important, right? So if you're selling, you can be selling to the wrong market, which will help your business. So first thing is that your own market, do they want low quality products? Because if they want that, right, then you might be selling to the wrong market. Because low quality is more so, so it's because if you sell in terms of pricing, but still high quality, then that might be challenging. But in terms of low quality and expensive, there are two different markets. So I'd like to understand from his own perspective, like, is it the same market that they are actually selling to? Target markets? Because the products are different. Okay. Is this something you can answer? Yeah, I think he, he's typing. He said okay. it's, a, it's expensive, but with high quality. So his product is expensive, but oh, high quality. because it's, 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 all, it's also because it's high quality. Okay, so my first advice would be to identify the market, identify the customers the need for his product. Because maybe for example, the, the, the customers in my heart might be buying high quality because they do not have a, a, another option. Okay, so they might necessarily want the low quality, but because his, his own product is the only available product, it becomes the, the required product. But if the government has brought about the low quality product and the same people, the same um, customers are moving to that product, that means they were, not, they were, not, they were actually not his target market. The target market are those customers that derive value in the high quality products that he is actually selling. Okay. So he needs to identify those customers. A lot of us have that challenges of selling to the wrong, not selling to the wrong target market, but at a particular time, we do not, our, our, our market is actually large. So we've not actually segmented the market. If we're able to segment our market, understand those who that depend on the, on the value we offer. So you can be selling a product and you have different segments of, market, of the market buying your product, but they are buying it for different reasons. So you being able to understand your customers and knowing why they are buying your product in the first place allows you to be able to target the right customers and offer value for those ones that really need the value. So the, the customers they might be selling to might not want the high quality, might just be after, just give us something that is affordable. So okay. two things that can happen is that you can also decide to expand your product range, right? And create a product for that segment, right? Using a lower, using lower, um, so it's actually using like, like cheaper raw materials, right? To be able to compete with the government, okay? But while still maintaining that same product range that provides high quality. And most times I tell um, entrepreneurs not to label, not, not to give it this, not to be, label it under the same brand, not to confuse customers. Because you cannot be selling, if you say you're selling high product, high quality, then you start selling low quality of the same product, right? Consumers might get confused and think that, okay, so that means all along you'll be selling low quality. So you can actually have a different product range that has a different brand, right? But focused on that, low, that lower quality market. So you're able to not to lose that market. Because right now what's going to happen is that if they continue this way, they will, it might end up losing that market. So either he identifies the target market that needs high quality, right? Or it, it develops a product with lesser, with cheaper raw materials to provide for that market that is already losing to the government. And the other part too is how are the consumers able to distinguish between the high and the low quality? So there might be a need to educate to your customers uh, and let them know that your product is high quality. It has these kind, it has these benefits to them and make them aware of the value that they are getting when they purchase your product vis-a-vis -vis patronizing the one coming from the government. So the awareness piece is also going to be important. Right. Mm -hmm. So very, yeah. good, very good comment. So based on, even based on following up on this, what you just said right now, it's also important that if you're going to compete, because most times you might be providing a product that there is, you have very, um, so it, it has, there's lack of information, okay? But because 
a lot of market that time you were doing well with the product in the market, you didn't see the need for. So you, the government challenging you now or competing with you gives you the opportunity to create awareness and inform the market about what you are really providing for them. So we need to be creative about how we inform, how we create, how we inform our markets, how we let them know the benefits of our products. So it has to focus on the benefits. So in as much as you might have lower quality, right? Focus on why it's important to buy the high quality. Let them know why. Let the customers understand the reason. So it's basically about creating value because they might see, they might not see the reason why they are paying so much for that product. So they need to understand why should we pay this much for this product? And it's left for the, 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 the business owner, the owner of the product, to create that awareness and let the customers understand this is why you're paying for the benefits that comes with it. So it's important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abuche. Um, I think Joshua have a hand up. Joshua, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Yeah, so it's just um, a contribution to my colleague's question. Um, so the, the government is providing fertilizers because I'm a consumer of fertilizer. So um, you, you, usually the government fertilizers, there's a limit. For instance, a farmer cannot buy more than, let's say, 10 bucks per season. So there is a gap there. So any farmer who needs more would either have to wait or they have to go somewhere else to buy. So if my colleague does a little bit of market segmentation, it could, he could actually be able to just take his, his fertilizers at the right time when most farmers have probably exhausted the 10 acres or make them in the 10 fertilizer box of fertilizer they get with the subsidy. The other thing is there was um, a company that was to introduce fertilizers from Germany. And what these guys did is that they had a demonstration farm. And this demonstration farm, they had a group of farmers using the conventional one the government provides, and then another group of farmers using what they are bringing from Germany. And then farmers are called, come and have a look for yourself. So when you visually, see that, oh my God, this thing is giving these guys more yield. Obviously, as a farmer, you want to buy the best quality one. And maybe you can say, well, you can't bring farmers from everywhere from the country because it's far. But you could have a video on your phone or on your iPad or even on WhatsApp and circulate it for farmers to see that, well, this is a conventional fertilizer the government sells and this is how much yield you can get. And then people can see the farm and then they compare it with yours visually then everybody would not have to do a lot of talking to get farmers to switch to your, to your fertilizers. All right. Um, you were, uh, the first question that was asked uh, during the beginning of the lecture, I lost my connection and I wanted to ask, I want to ask, uh, I wanted to find out, I, for instance, I produce uh, pork. So, and I, I supply it to the mall. How innovative can I be? Can I be? How much innovative can I be? You supply to the mall. Hello? Yeah, so, so, so he, he produces pork and supply it to the mall. So, so, so his question is, how innovative can he be? Okay, all right. The first question I would ask you is that, how do you take your orders? Hello? Okay, so what I do is that when I take the orders, I slaughter and I dress and I, 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 I get a cold van. I hire a cold van and I supply it to them. That's how I do it. All right, so the, question, the first thing I have, I have for you is that, how do you get your orders? So how do you take the orders from the company? Oh, what uh, I basically do, when I want an order from a particular mall or re restaurant, I write a letter to them. And a letter? State, hmm. Yeah, a letter to them. State my particular prices and all that, how I'll do it. So okay, no, so, I, so, okay sorry, sorry to cut you off. That's, that's you acquiring. So your existing customers right now, your existing ones, right? How do you... Yeah. Yes. Their orders. How do you get their orders, the existing ones, not the new ones? But they just call me. They call me and say they want this number or this size, these sizes. All right. So is there that, a way? That's how I take the order. Is there a system you can put in place in which? So look at your. Um, so look at um, in terms of inventory. All right. Is that is there a way you can tell when the product will be when they will need to pre-order? So, because what you're doing right now is that they, when, okay. when they need you, they call you, right? Okay. Yes. So uh, when some of them do, they 
they, they have a particular customer like this. He takes 120 kilos every week. So that one, I have okay. him always. I'm just, I just supply it to him. But there are okay. others that you have to call me. And others too, I will have to call them and say, oh, I have, I have pork now. Maybe previously they had asked me and I said, I did not. Okay, good. What I'm looking at for you is that I'm trying to see whether you could build a system, right? That could that could um, increase or reduce okay. the, the interaction in terms of interaction, but create a system where you can have, so imagine if you increase your capacity, you increase mm -hmm. your customers, right? Them calling you all the time, okay. right, to tell you, yeah. it's like a traditional way of, of you, of that yeah. service, actually. So when we say being innovative, right, is that use technology, right? Develop a system, yeah. right? So they don't have to call your company, your, your, call your salesperson to put it order, right? Automatically, maybe at every, for the customer that always um, get the 120, uh, 120 kilo every month, it's more like a reminder and it, it prompts on his own, um, so maybe more like a text or, and tells him that, okay, so we've taken, and you just confirm if we're doing the same order for the month. But not more, I don't want, so it's, we're looking at more of you doing more automated system. Okay, you said I should get an automated Okay. What I'm, so what I'm actually saying is that when we talk about bringing innovation, is about bringing something, right? Something that can um, improve your service. So it can also, so I just give you an example of bringing automation into it, one, but there are other creative ways in which you can improve that service. So it's just creating something, creating value for them. So mind going beyond, so right now it's just about the products and the customer. They want the your product you supply. That's the relationship I see between you and your customer. So use innovation to create a stronger relationship between you and your customer. What other, what other benefits can you offer them? Minus just supplying the the pork meat. What other benefits can you offer them? Do you think? Well, after supplying them, sometimes I call them to find out if the product I give them is is okay. Like, are they okay with it? Are they not? Or they are not okay with it? Yes, and they will they will give their their thoughts whether is is the fat content is too low or is too high or is normal. I mean, after you supply them, right? Maybe one week after you supply them they get a prompt that tells them, asks them questions that, um, were you okay with? So more like a feedback, but not you calling them. So it's more like, it's more like a service system where they can give you information about the product without you necessarily calling them on the phone. So developing a feedback system, basically. I can't really tell you the network is very, where you can hear me very well. Yes, I think we lost him just a little bit, but um, I believe the point is well made. Yes, so mine is just, um, I uh, a recommendation. I, I read a book uh, last year called The Blue Ocean Strategy, and it's a very very nice book on on competition and teaches you how to set yourself apart by doing really basic stuff. So it's, I think it's even available online, and anybody who is interested can look at it. Okay, so so the, the Blue Ocean Strategy. Blue Ocean Strategy, yes. Okay. Publisher is Harvard Business Review. Okay. It's by one uh, W. Chan. It's a really nice book. Okay. W. Chan. Okay. So, so we will send the title out uh, when we send a recording of this uh, so that other entrepreneurs will have the chance to, uh, to look up that book. Thanks for that recommendation. I want to thank Uche for taking the time to facilitate this very engaging and insightful presentation on the competitiveness. I think the lessons that, uh, the lessons that we have uh, gathered today have been very helpful. And I hope that we can implement some of these in our own businesses and remain competitive in the, in the long term. I also want to thank everyone for making time to join us here um, and those in the, in, the, in the background that are providing logistical services. Uh, my colleague Helen, Alexandria, and, um, <clears throat> and everyone who played a vital role in making these webinar series a success. I want to reiterate that this may be the, the last in the phase, the phase one, but it's not the last of the webinars that will be organizing. We will be sending you updates as and when um, we begin a new um, series. So thank you all very much for your contribution 
um, for your participation. We value your engagement and we hope to continue engaging you in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, on this note, thank you. I want to thank you all for your time and I look forward to reconnecting with you again soon. Thank you.